Good morning. Let's go ahead and get started. Good morning and welcome. Um, my name is Jeff Braddock. I'm with the Bridgespan Group, a nonprofit that works with other nonprofits and philanthropists on their strategies. And I'll be moderating uh, this morning's session. I want to thank you all for coming here. I know you had the choice to go next door to talk about kind of giving and getting money, or you could come here and talk about impact. So it's kind of the true believers, the kind of in that, uh, that are here this morning, and that's great. Um, I, I think one of the meta themes actually of the morning is the relationship between that room and this room over the course of time in terms of kind of how money um, relates to impact, how impact affects flows, how impact uh, measurement and assessment affects uh, kind of improvement processes in nonprofits. So we'll come to that topic uh, in just a little bit. Um, let me explain what the plan is. Several people pointed out to me that we, we won the award for the largest panel for a session. Um, and so I want to describe a little bit about kind of how we're going to structure uh, the, the conversation. We have several innovators in the area of performance measurement and metrics um, with us this morning who have built platforms, who have both worked at the individual level and have built platforms that at a minimum create shared understandings of what metrics are, kind of shared, shared agreement on what, about what metrics are in different arenas, um, all the way to shared strategies against which then met metrics are built. Um, and all of these are works in progress, and so we're going to have the opportunity to hear, hear about them, hear what's working, um, hear what's some of the challenges are uh, kind of from this set of folks. Then we have another set of folks that are experts. Um, actually, all of these folks are experts. I got to be careful about how I distinguish kind of who's expert and who's not. They're all experts. Um, and we'll it, kind of after we, we hear from the first group and have a discussion about what works, what they've learned, what the challenges have been, um, we'll then shift to a kind of stepping back and looking at kind of what are the dynamics in the broader sector that are either leading to the adoption of these kinds of practices practices and the adoption of these kinds of platforms um, and what the challenges are and the opportunities are in that realm. Uh, in the middle, we will get input from the audience. We want to make sure that we kind of see if we're connecting with questions on your mind. Um, uh, and also, this in some sense is a unique opportunity to have a kind of a feedback loop on these processes and on these platforms, because a lot of you are the types of folks that I think the, the aspiration is for many of these platforms that this would be helpful to you, this would engage you, um, and really support your work more broadly. Um, this is also part, the fishbowl as it's described, um, is connected to the Aspen uh, Philanthropy Working Group on Metrics, and we have a few of the members of that group here as well that will be listening and periodically jumping in, jumping in as well, um, and that's Jane Wales, Paul Brest, Carol Larson, and Lori Ariaga um, Andresen, uh, and so they will also all everyone's bios are in the uh, in the book, so I won't go through them all. But they are with the the Aspen Group, and will jump in periodically um, as well. And I think if you if you step back and you think, what's the fundamental question that kind of that, that's the umbrella over all of this right now? Um, that question is, can we achieve the ends that all of us are working on in different fields? absent rigorous kind of understandings of measurement and impact assessment and kind of a shared understanding of what it takes to get things done and knowing whether or not we're on track. Um, and when I think about the presentation late yesterday afternoon by Hal Harvey where you have kind of this, this deep, you know, this kind of very comprehensive strategy with measures against it, with clarity about how people work in. It may be the paradigmatic case of kind of an integrated strategy with ways people plug in, but obviously not all fields look like that and have that kind of, uh, kind of, natural, uh, kind of natural ability to, to have metrics that people can all agree on. So I think that is the overarching question because the, the, at the heart of the performance measurement question is kind of how do we increase the impact in the work that we're doing against the issues that we all care deeply and are committed uh, committed to change. Now we're going to start the session today with a presentation, um, a very brief presentation by Mark Kramer um, from FSG that's done some terrific work on kind of mapping the landscape of shared measurement systems and we'll use that as a launching point for the conversation with the various folks that we have here this morning. So let me turn it over to Mark. Great. Thank you very much, Jeff. And I think we have a couple slides that we can put up. Thank you. Um, I have to say I've been doing research in philanthropy and evaluation for 
probably 10 or 15 years. And uh, this uh, recent report that we did that the Hewlett Foundation funded on shared measurement, and there are some copies of it around, uh, has changed my thinking about not just measurement, but about evaluation uh, more than anything else I've done in the last 15 years. I, I think there have really been sort of three fundamentally different ways of thinking about evaluation over time. And each of them has been driven by how funders think that they can achieve large-scale change. And so the first approach, kind of the classical approach, is a sort of social science approach to evaluation. And it's rooted in the idea that funders are the research and development arm of society and they can find new and innovative ways to solve social problems. And then they can study the approach, prove that their intervention actually solved the problem, and then other people will replicate it and roll it out. And that requires a very rigorous social science study, a randomized control trial, uh, to prove that this particular intervention caused the result. There are a couple limitations to this approach. The first is that nobody actually ever rolls anything out. So it doesn't necessarily work. The second is that to say you have a randomized control trial doesn't necessarily answer the question because there are a lot of methodolo methodological issues and questions that those trials raise. And so my favorite example is uh, Head Start, the, the preschool program in the US that's been around for 40 years, uh, has been evaluated 3,400 times. <laughs> and the answer is we're not sure. <laughs> so uh, moving beyond the randomized control trial approach, I think in the last 10 or 20 years, we've seen an increasing emphasis on evaluation as a form of performance management. And it's been the idea that funders achieve their impact by finding effective organizations and then scaling them up. And so what you need is not a scientific study that proves this intervention worked, but what you need is timely data that gives you a sense of what's working, what's not working, and how to improve over time your own organization's performance. The third trend, and what I really want to talk about today, and I think we're just at the very, very beginning of this movement, although, as Jeff said, there are terrific examples here at this table, is to think about shared measurement and a systemic approach to evaluation, which is to say not to think about evaluating an individual grant or even an individual organization, but to think about how do all of the organizations that are tackling a problem find common measures of performance. And that's what I want to talk about for a minute. Uh, so first, here's the problem. As funders, naturally, we give a grant to an organization and we think about evaluation in terms of what did our grant accomplish. And so we ask the organization to report back to us about our grant in particular. And the problem with this is that each grantee ends up reporting on something different. I'm sorry. Thank you, Jen. <laughs> Ah, isn't this better? Oh, good. I feel like I'm in a nightclub or something. Anyway, um, e each grantee ends up reporting to each funder on a different set of criteria. And obviously, this is extremely burdensome. And it also means that you can't compare performance, whether you're a funder trying to evaluate different organizations or whether you're a nonprofit working on the issue trying to figure out if somebody else is doing it better because everybody's measuring different things. And so it really becomes a barrier to the social sector's ability to solve large, complex social problems, which no one single organization is going to ever be able to solve alone. Now, the idea that you could have shared measurement systems seems like you know, the ultimate holy grail, a fantasy. What was most astonishing to us when we did this report is we found more than 20 examples, and again, some of the best are seated at this table, of systems that were already up and running, where anywhere from a couple hundred to as many as 8,000 organizations are using the same measures of performance. And what we realized is that it took the development of the internet to make this possible, that it's only in the last number of years that organizations could download tools very inexpensively all over the world, aggregate data, generate reports, and do this easily wherever they might be located. And this is a fundamental shift in the sector.
So as we studied these different shared measurement systems, we found there were really three different types. And the first we called a shared measurement system is simply a common platform that enables different organizations uh, to report on their progress, each organization picking its own measures. And there's a great group called Success Measures, which was developed by community development finance institutions and community development organizations around the country. And there are now three or 400 community development organizations that are using these tools. And they can choose from 50 or 60 different measures which ones they want to track to measure their own performance and then generate reports that they can give to their funders or that they can learn from themselves. What's fascinating is the increase in efficiency that things, this brings about. It took three years to develop this system. It cost about a million dollars to develop it. But now, organizations can join for $2,500 a year. Imagine, comprehensive evaluation for $2,500 a year. It's truly a remarkable step forward in cost savings. It also improves the data quality because you've actually had this collective input into what should be measured and how it should be measured. And it creates greater credibility about the data because it's not just my organization saying this is what I want to measure, but in fact the field. The second type of system we saw, we called a comparative performance system. And the difference is here, everybody's measuring the same things and they're measuring them the same way. And there's a great example here at the table uh, from the Cultural Data Project that Marion Godfrey, I'm sure, will talk about in a few minutes, uh, where 8,000 arts organizations in several different states are now using this online tool to measure performance, uh, all different aspects of their performance, from financial performance to who sees the organization, who actually sees or participates in the cultural activity. And it's enabled them not only to become more cost effective, but to become more knowledgeable. A theater company can say, oh, you know, this other theater company has 70% earned income. How did they do that? We don't, we don't achieve that much. Um, it also has enabled them to talk about the field as a whole and to look at the contribution to the economy and to the culture on a statewide basis or on a regional basis of all of the arts organizations together, something we've really never been able to say about a field. The third category we, call, we saw, we called an adaptive learning system. Uh, and Jeff Edmondson is here at the table from Strive. Uh, Strive is a collection of organizations in Cincinnati, 300 organizations that are all involved in school reform, from preschool all the way through college to career. And Strive has been able to come up with common measures of performance and to enable these organizations not only to learn from each other, but to begin to align their efforts to collaborate more effectively. And I think this is perhaps the most powerful thing we've seen, is that these shared measurement systems can be a step away from thinking about individual organizations as a tool for change, toward thinking about systems as a tool for change, collections of organizations as a tool for change. The, the last slide I want to leave you with is a, a project we'd done uh, with the Packard Foundation that, and Carol alluded to it the other night, uh, with the Marine Fisheries Group, where we actually, over about a year and a half, were able to work with 17 grantees, all of their major grantees, to come up with a common theory of change. That all of the organizations, these are the major organizations in the field in the US, bought into and agreed to. And it wasn't, you know, brilliance on our part to come up with a particular theory of change. It's, they were the ones who came up with it. But imagine the power if organizations in a field actually worked together, actually had the same approach to a theory of change. And so we'll talk today about shared measurement systems and there are copies of this report around, but my hope is that the shared measurement system is really a first step toward a different way of thinking about how funders achieve impact which is working not just with individual grantees, but working with systems as a whole. Thank you. But I really, I really do encourage people to take a look at the reports because it, it really is thought provoking and pushes, kind of pushes your thinking forward on thinking about impact assessment. Just before we dive into the conversation, if we go back to the slide right before this, if that's possible. 
Oh, you, you. Yes. I just wanted to get a quick sense, just to get a sense of folks in the room. How many people in their work are participating in some version of the first column, shared measurement? Just to get a sense of, is that, if you could just raise your hands high so we can take a, take a look. All right, a, hand, a handful here. Second one, comparative performance measurement. Okay, again, a small, small group. And adaptive learning, a handful. All right, no, great. That's, so we have some, some folks here that can perhaps join in and kind of provide some examples and, uh, and data. A, a final question, how many people feel that the, the pressure on performance in the work that you do is greater now than it was three years ago? So for, where, and just very quickly, we're not gonna use a mic, but where, where is that pressure coming from? So just, just anybody say, kind of in your own case, where, what, what's applying pressure that's leading you to feel it? Fun, funders? We. There's a we that's a kind of a covering law for a fair, for a number of folks here. So funders are increasing pressure. Others, other kind of other sources of pressure that make this particularly important now? Government. Government. Transparency of the internet, so there's kind of sources of internet, people can look at things. Anything, anything else? Okay, go, go ahead. Corporate and private sector, back here. So a huge, I mean, a huge lever is actually the energy that it creates internally, since that, in fact, is the magnet that's bringing people to the organization to do the work. The fact that now you can see that you actually are having the impact you'd hope for is a giant kind of lever and motivator in, in all of this, too. Or The culture of new generation engaged donors and the social networks, both physical and technological, that are developing around the individual donor. So networks around the individual donors, and an interesting kind of suggestion that we'll come to in a minute about diff kind of different kinds of donors perhaps playing in this in slightly different ways. Just one more, and then we're going to... Uh, the financial fall. How, how, uh, and that's just put pressure on the, the kind of the more bang for the buck phenomena in terms of actually with that kind of pressure, that kind of impact uh, kind of means more. Kat? No. I mean, I'd also like to include, there are some very ambitious executive directors, leaders of organizations, who want to understand this stuff. Yeah, no, I think that's, I mean, we often, and I framed it as kind of looking outside to where the pressure's coming from, but the, the, the pressure, I mean, what's always most striking to me is the extraordinary leadership it takes um, in the sector by virtue of the executive directors of these organizations to kind of define a bar of impact that they're going to aim towards and then actually push towards it because, in fact, in many cases, the market forces, if you will, such as they are, are weaker than they might be in other circumstances. So I think it's, a, it's often a tremendous act of leadership that people are kind of taking that on and setting the bar for themselves high. Now, these platforms actually help you set the bar, arguably. I mean, kind of the, in, in one thing, you might, you might look at the shift from kind of a, a self-defined measure of success to now, in these several of these cases, being able to look across fields and, and compare and think a little bit differently about kind of whether you're on track or off track. So let me, let me start um, by asking Marion to, to share a little bit about, and, and Mark alluded to this, um, Marion uh, Godfrey is the um, uh, leader of the Cultural Data Project that Mark referenced just a moment ago. And what I want to ask is just what kind of what was the motivating kind of impulse to do this? I mean, what was the driver for it? And if you can just give us a snippet on what it is, and I'm gonna ask each of these folks to do that, um, and then we're gonna dig into the conversation, but just so the audience kind of gets a sense of what these platforms are. Thank you. Th thank you, can you hear me? No, no, no. Do, I, do I have to speak, aha, there we go. Thank you, I'm really pleased to be here, particularly because I know arts is not necessarily the topic of this meeting, but I hope the work that we've done with our colleagues has something that is transferable to um, all of your areas of interest. Uh, the Cultural Data Project started um, in Pennsylvania when a group of Pennsylvania funders, both public and private, were frustrated by our inability to talk about 
the impacts of the arts and culture sector as a sector in our communities, and therefore to make some kind of a case for the arts as being a legitimate subject for social policy consideration as well as funding. And uh, in Pennsylvania, we had, uh, we just didn't have any data. We had this, or we had, there was actually a lot of data, but it was very um, non-comparable, non-reliable, um, just not useful. And the funders kept asking for more and more and more data from, from their uh, constituent groups. And we finally had a mutiny on our hand because we were collecting all this really bad data that we could not use. And we were wasting a lot of our constituents' time. So we came together and uh, we quickly realized we could not do a complete uh, universal application process, but we agreed we could collect historical data in the same way for every organization and that we would all use it and that we could use the technology to make uh, make the data more um, easy to input for the cultural organizations and also give them tools to pull it out themselves and use it. Uh, so uh, the Cultural Data Project is, has always been a collaboration among groups of public and private funders. It's an online tool whereby organizations put their data in once a year at the end of their fiscal year, and then they're able to generate um, uh, funder reports for multiple funders during the course of the year just by a click of a mouse. That's the first benefit. Uh, secondly, they get to pull their own data out uh, and to do trend reports on themselves and benchmarking comparison reports on other organizations in the system so that it becomes a learning tool for the organization. First of all, they get the data back. It, it's, it's the power comes back to the power of their data comes back to them, which has often not been the case with these, with these systems. And they get to use it as a learning and management tool. Uh, thirdly, it can be, as, as um, Mark said, it can be aggregated and used in a kind of an advocacy or policy context. And fourthly, equally important, the, the funding organizations are able to use this data to analyze where they're getting the impact out of their own grant making and where they need to perhaps tweak or refine or even significantly rethink their grant making in order to get the kind of impact that they're looking for in their arts community or in their community community at large. Um, so that's the thumbnail. I think maybe I'll stop there so for now. Perfect. How many funders, just so, how many funders are involved in the collaborative? We, we now have um, 20, 12 individual um, organizations, 12, 12 funders funding, using it for 20 funding programs, uh, I, Pew, for example, uses it for multiple funding programs in Pennsylvania. We are now in seven states, uh, in addition to Pennsylvania, Maryland, California, New York, Illinois, Ohio, Massachusetts, uh, and we are going to go uh, launch in Michigan in a couple of weeks. Michigan has, uh, you know, a state that's been really struggling and it has been fierce about bringing this to their state. Um, and we have uh, about 150 funding programs around the country using it in those states and uh, about now actually up to about 8,400 organizations, cultural organizations that are in the system. And so we will continue to expand statewide and we're looking also for ways to kind of get a national overlay so that we don't have to go state by state to get to all 50 states. <laughs> Thank you. Let me uh, go to uh, Brian Trelstead, who's uh, the Chief Investment o Officer at Acumen. And just the same question, kind of what motivated the creation of a very interesting platform that's sure. a global platform, uh, collecting data, and so, and then we'll go from there again a little bit later about the impact of it, but kind of what led you to, to do that and kind of where does it stand today and how exactly does it work? Sure. Thank you, Jeff. Um, yesterday's panel on franchising was uh, a great sort of lead into the question and the motivation where the, uh, our colleagues from uh, Vision Spring, Living Goods, and Invenia were asked the final question, what, what are the metrics that you use? And each of the different franchising models talked about number of franchisees and revenue for, per franchise. Um, but there really is no standard in our sector, which is impact investing. Acumen Fund raises philanthropic funding and then invests in early stage high growth social enterprises like Vision Spring, like Water Health, and others that are here. And as I started to tackle the problem, and I think Kat's point is right on, that the aspirations of Acumen Fund from the outset were to really set the bar high on understanding metrics, we looked around and realized there were no tools available to help us do this. There were many platforms available for venture capitalists to track and manage their portfolios on a financial dimension, but there wasn't anything that would allow you to track and manage the social or operational measures. 
And so we started to work um, first with uh, some support from the Cisco Foundation and then with Google engineers uh, in coming up with a tool that would allow us to simply clarify those measures in each of our investments that we wanted to keep a handle on, understand what might be measures across each portfolio company, and use them in, in, in Mark's uh, sort of parlance as a performance management tool. We wanted to make managing our portfolio very easy for our distributed global team of social investors. When we started to build the system, it was important for us to think about managing the, each investment against its plan. We funded them to do a plan. Uh, most of them are usually off plan. That's not unusual for venture. But how close you get to plan is an important measure of managerial capability. We wanted to measure them against the past. How were they doing against year-on-year -year growth? Um, but the third P that was really missing was peer. We didn't know what our portfolio of 15, then at the time now 40 investments, was doing relative to the other hundreds or thousands of social investments in emerging markets. And so we worked with the Rockefeller Foundation um, and PwC and Deloitte and B-Lab to essentially come up with a, a, a set of data measures that would allow us to align our data collection with those of our peers, um, and that's called the Impact Reporting and Investment Standard. So it's a, it's a multi-piece um, sort of ecosystem that's emerging primarily in the impact investment space, which is trying to answer the question, if you're going to invest in this asset class, uh, which is sort of small businesses, it's not microfinance, but we're all working closely with microfinance, it's domestic and it's international, what sort of return are you getting on your, on your money? What sort of return are you getting for the social uh, investment? And so what has evolved over time is that the, the tool that we built with Google has been transferred to Salesforce. It's now freely available to anyone who has access to Salesforce through their licensing, a very generous licensing policy to nonprofits. It allows any social investor to track and manage their own portfolios, and if they so opt to contribute the data to a shared data um, uh, base that the, the Rockefeller's Global Impact Investing Network is going to manage. It's not as, um, a, as clean as the Cultural Data Project, which we've sort of aspired to. Um, and it recognizes the fact that our little pulse tool, we call the software tool pulse, because we wanted to take the pulse of our investments um, over time, is not going to be adopted by more than 1 or 5 or 10 percent of the impact investing universe, and that there are many large institutional investors like the IFC uh, or some of the European development banks who actually have installed databases that we'd like to get access to the data. And so the, the IRIS database has been built using a technology that allows for aggregation of data from many different sources and types. It's called the XBRL data standard, which is now required by the SEC to aggregate all public company data. So it's been built in a very collaborative and open format. But what I think has driven its success is the, the, the power of the tool to make the job of the portfolio manager easier um, in understanding the challenges at their investment. And if it doesn't pass that test, um, the, the broader effort is not going to succeed. And I think we're at the point, we're still um, six or eight months away from being able to offer the, the same kind of benchmarking and data aggregation that the Cultural Data Project uh, is able to offer. But that really is the prize. People are adopting this, not only because it's an easier tool, but because it has the value of information that can inform their investment choices. Great. Thank you very much. Let me turn to Roxy um, Jurdy, who's at the Greater Kansas City Community Foundation, where a tool and a platform called Donors Edge um, was developed and created and has a little bit different flavor, being a kind of geographically based uh, tool that is actually trying to get, a, get an understanding of all in a, in, a plat in, a, in a shared sense of performance across a diverse set of nonprofits in a given community. So a little bit different angle. So if you could also let us know kind of what the kind of how, kind of what motivated that at the outset. And then just again, very briefly, a little bit about the, the platform. Um, again, I'm Roxy Jurdy with the Greater Kansas City Community Foundation, and uh, we've been at this for eight years, and I look at the, think about the internet, when we first started collecting data about nonprofits, we had an Excel spreadsheet, and we thought it was big to move to Word, so when we got um, online, that was really great progress, so how quickly things change, but um, 
It might help to set a little context. Uh, as a community foundation, we are very donor-centric, donor-driven. Most of, we're 30 years old. Most of our donors are still living. And we work with folks from um, uh, small funds, five, ten thousand to a hundred million dollars. And what we were seeing is we had 150, 180, 190 million dollars going out in grants every year. And we really, our board, could not answer what difference is all this making? How do we know what's really happening with all these dollars? So the problem we wanted to solve has the magnitude kept increasing and grants of all sizes. How could we really get a handle on how the nonprofits were performing and were they really effective? So we started this journey journey with great help from the Hewlett Foundation. Uh, Bridgespand helped us design this as well. Um, we again started just collecting the data and it was a big challenge to go to the nonprofits because they really thought, oh my gosh, we are going to be in the, in the community foundation database and it's really an ATM. The money is going to fly into us. And to manage expectations was really, really, really hard. And we still have some eight years later that maybe have not gotten a grant from a donor at the community foundation. So the whole marketing of this was very critical um, just to get the data. Um, we have about 750, 800 nonprofits in Kansas City that annually update this. They go online. We have a very small team that vets the data. We do the financial analysis. We have a common set of questions. So if it's an all volunteer, um, uh, we have barbershop quartets that are nonprofits to our multi-million dollar hospitals and our art museums. So they're all answering the same questions. So there's something nice about being viewed in the same context, no matter what your size is as a nonprofit. Um, so we uh, really also found that because we're kind of, as we say, feet on the street, we have relationships with nonprofits and also our fellow funders in, in our community, we probably have 90, 100 different funders that use this. So if you're applying for a grant and they ask you if you have a donor edge profile, we have a little icon that says reviewed by your community foundation, which means it's up to date. We know this doesn't work if the data isn't current and of good quality. So if they have that little icon for a grant competition, they maybe answer five questions instead of 150. So that's really saved a tremendous amount of time in our community. Um, so we've got it up and running and, and have built it. What we've also find is how can you make it in uh, useful bytes and user friendly? We've really worked hard to make it almost like a dashboard when you sign in. We've added video that's posted on YouTube that if you're reviewed, you can include that. Um, people are visual, not always reading sea of type. We've tried to add more graphs. Um, and we've also taken pieces of it and incorporated into, I'm going to call them donor products. Um, for our larger funds, we create a report called a charitable investment review, and we'll list their top five grantees and life to date how much they've given. And I can't tell you how many donors don't know over the life of nine, ten years. I've given four, five hundred, half a million dollars to this nonprofit. We lift out their um, program results and, and marry that with you've invested a five hundred thousand dollars. Here's what's being accomplished. So that has really opened up wonderful conversations of either increased support or questions of do I go deeper in this sector or do I really support this one nonprofit. Um, we've also created other products to get the general public to use this data as well. We have a little giving card that um, is like a target card, but you redeem it on a nonprofit. But it, you have to go to where the information is on nonprofits. So um, doing that, as well as lots of giving circles we work with, we incorporate using these profiles in their grant process. So we try to, I think, Paul, you said, get people in the vicinity of good information, and um, they're using it more. So we. Um, Again, piloted this in Kansas City. There's 13 foundations across the country that use this. I think we have about 7,000 profiles that are all using this common platform in questions. So, great. Thank you very much. Let me let me quickly turn it to um, Jeff Edmondson, who's the executive director of Strive. And I guess a question. And Mark alluded to your your approach is a little bit different. You're kind of on the right hand side of those three columns. And maybe if you kind of highlighted, kind of what where is a point of difference kind of in terms of what you're, what you're doing as compared to these, and then just a thumbnail sketch on what you're doing. Uh, essentially, uh, in Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky, it's, it's a much more localized strategy to essentially build what we're, we're uh, referring to in academic circles as the civic infrastructure uh, to drive improved outcomes over time. 
Um, and essentially what Strive is, is it's a, it's a partnership that brings together the nonprofit, philanthropic, business, uh, civic, and education sectors uh, to weave together how they support children so that they can succeed um, from cradle all the way through into a meaningful career. Uh, essentially going to the concept of the Casey's children's budget from years ago, how could we begin to organize resources uh, to support children, not based on uh, the system or the department that they come from, but on the needs of the individual child. Um, so we've been working at this over essentially four years. We had a, uh, a what we call a grassroots movement among grass tops leaders um, that emerged when they looked at the data that essentially said for every 10 ninth graders in our region, uh, only two were completing some form of college education within six years after high school graduation. Uh, essentially, the, the, the thought was is that we're not gonna be able in Ohio to compete with Indiana, much less India, if we don't begin to turn out more uh, students with some form of college education. And, and there was a critical moment when the coroner in our community, and that's to highlight that this is a really local effort, but the coroner in our community stood up at a meeting and he said, not only are we gonna have uh, not enough kids graduating from college, I'm gonna keep having dead kids shot on my tables if we don't start taking a more systemic approach to how we support children. Uh, he said, if we start one more program, I'm gonna go crazy. And the funders then stood up in our community and said, uh, yeah, we're gonna go crazy too. Uh, because we feel like uh, we've got a spray and pray mentality uh, to funding. We spray resources all over the place. We pray good things will happen. Uh, but we don't have a coordinated way to actually make this work. Um, so all that said, there's, there's sort of three critical components that are relevant to this conversation. Um, the first is that when you bring together all these different sectors, all those different se sectors speak different dialects. Right, uh, it, it's like a, a, a mini tower of Babel getting in a room to try to to try to take on a given problem, and essentially what we found after we were loaned an executive from Procter and Gamble, which is based in Cincinnati, that the only thing that can cut through those different dialects or translate is a better way to say is data. Uh, if you put data on the table that people trust and that people believe is on target, they will begin to communicate with each other because it shines a light. Uh, on, on what really needs to get done. Uh, so we took some time to develop some community level indicators that we could agree on from the cradle to career continuum. Uh, we put out an annual report card across 12 measures. Uh, it started out at about 200 some measures and we whittled it down uh, over the course of an arduous six months to 12. Uh, we're about to put out our third annual report card and essentially this is a mechanism for the community to understand on a regular basis what kind of progress we're making. Uh, the key being though, it's not a report that sits on a shelf, it's a report where we have the key leadership from all those different sectors sitting around the table looking at the data and saying, okay, if we only have 48% of kids entering kindergarten on target developmentally, we need to really focus on early childhood education and we need to put some energy behind that. And if we know that our college enrollment rates are dropping, uh, we need to really spend some time on that. So the report card becomes the motivator for action in the community. Um, the, second, the second piece of the puzzle is, is that uh, we've essentially built a data platform in partnership with Microsoft. Um, they, they came in because Procter & Gamble is their biggest customer, and they said, how could we possibly help you in Cincinnati, Ohio? And uh, they turned them over to, to the partnership, and we said, well, we need a platform where we could not only have the academic data from early childhood, K-12, and higher ed, we need all the data from all the programs and services as well. So we have now a platform that we'll be launching throughout the, the Cincinnati Public Schools District where you're gonna be able to, a teacher or an educator or a program provider will not only be able to see the academic results of a child, they'll be able to see if they're in an after school program, if, a, if they're in a tutoring program or a mentoring program, and if they're not in one of those programs and need one, they'll be able to access that. But perhaps most important with that system for funders is that we recently did an analysis that tried to connect uh, hearing and uh, sight tests to academic outcomes. It took us over 100 hours of analysis to harvest all the data, organize it, analyze it, and, and begin to actually turn out a report. This platform will enable us to do that in five minutes. 
right? So the ability to have the data in one place, to your point about the internet, what Mark said about the internet enabling these kind of, these kind of conversations is critical. And then the last point on that is that you can't assume that once you have the data in a singular place that people are gonna know how to actually use the data. So we have been working very hard to train all different community members on continuous improvement, which is something that uh, effective organizations in the public, private, nonprofit sector use, but essentially to say to and empower uh, individual organizations or collective bodies to use data on an ongoing basis to drive action. And then my last point uh, on, on what we've been working on is that, uh, is that if you do not have an incentive for individual organizations or collective bodies to use data to drive decisions, over time it will fall off. The use of data will not continue. And so while the funders stood up after the coroner made his uh, dramatic statement about uh, students on his tables and said, we're tired of spray and pray, once we actually developed cohesive action plans around arts education or uh, after school programming to say we could organize these resources in such a way we could maximize impact, the legacy of funders, the, uh, the challenges around how do you actually change how you give to be more collaborative has prevented a lot of funders from actually investing in these coordinated action plans around high impact strategies uh, so that you could have maximum impact. And so uh, in our community, we've had the United Way, the Community Foundation, uh, Proctor, and a few other major donors who have agreed to fund data-driven action plans. But if in a given community, c funders cannot come together around a common mentality as the, the, the cultural data project, is that right? Mm -hmm. The, uh, you're not gonna be able to drive impact over time, and so in our community, we're really focused on, on getting uh, funders to work collaboratively. Great, and I'm gonna come to you in just a minute, Valerie, but I wanna ask a question building right off this to the three of you, because one of the subtexts to this whole approach is that it actually affects funder behavior, and that's kind of one of the driving motivators, and you're highlighting that um, you know, they, there may be a gap in some cases between the aspiration and the vision and then the reality of what happens on the ground. And I'm just curious for the other folks that have built these, um, they're tremendous platforms and exciting, and the sanitized three-minute version kind of makes them sound elegant and the funders came together and, and so forth, but, but has it really, I mean, when you step back and look, I mean, has it really moved the needle on changing how, thing, how, how money flows, kind of how funders are engaging, um, and in what ways, and if not, what's the untapped potential or just any? Um, well, I'll say uh, that that's a, I think that's a key question for the long-term sustainability of any of these programs is that the, it's, it, it, they only add value to the degree that they're used for impact. And uh, what we've learned so far is that, on the one hand, we have a small core of leadership funders, and most certainly including the Hewlett Foundation, which has not only supported the CDP in California, but has also used some of the data to help in, in its own arts program think about how how it operates and how it responds to its constituency. And there are some people out there who kind of, there are people who get, they get the uses of the data, but it can be, data can be very inert for somebody who doesn't know how to use it or doesn't think about it. And so one of the things that we're building into our system is a more aggressive ability for us to go out and promote uses of the, of the data to people who are already our partners, who, you know, have, believe it's a great civic thing to do, but haven't, don't really have the skills or haven't had the thought about what they're gonna do with it and how they're gonna use it for impact. And for us, that's very important because to the degree that our donors use it for their own benefit as well as for the benefit of their constituency, it's going to be value added for them and they're going to continue on with it. Brian? Yeah, I mean, I, I've, I, I would say that I think our donors care more that we care about metrics than they care about the metrics themselves. And I think we are in a, in a, a place right now of a, a collective action problem with our peers in the sector where they're has in fact been a fair amount of money going into private sector development organizations like Acumen Fund, like Root Capital, uh, TechnoServe. And the challenge for us as a sector is that unless we collaborate, we will not tap into the larger pools of capital that have funded, for example, microfinance. So we have intentionally collaborated to invest together 
on the belief that money will flow if we can show the right balance between financial and social return. Uh, I don't think that that capital will be unlocked at scale unless there are common measures and an ability to evaluate across fund opportunities. And so I would answer your question that no, not yet, perhaps on the individual organizational level, some funding has come, but the prize is a, a broader sectoral growth on the basis in part of the quality of the social information. And so the collaboration you're talking about is actually the collaboration of different platforms right. that are perhaps like yours com coming together with yet kind of a meta shared measurement system. That's correct. Would be the, would be the drive. With that in place, is there still a gap? I mean, your, your comment about the interest in the concept of metrics as compared to the interest in the actual data in the metrics, does that solve that or is that yet a different problem? or different challenge? Uh, well, I mean, the, the closest analog for us in the international development space has been the mixed market, which has been able to s create transparency among microfinance organizations. And I don't know whether that was uh, causal uh, or just arrived at the same time that a lot of funding moved into the microfinance sector. But I think the uh, ability for, for investors and donors to look across a spectrum of purely grant-based to blended value return to purely finance-first funds will unlock capital that right now is sort of sitting on the sidelines saying we don't think there's enough investable opportunities there. Mm -hmm. And Roxy, has it moved Has it moved kind of donors in these communities? Um, I think it's moved donors and one thing that it's really helped is a self-assessment tool for nonprofits. Um, we, they now oftentimes didn't know, well, what do they really want to know? And funders ask different things and with a common platform. And because we go back every year, if they haven't, let's say, do you have a succession plan or where are you on your strategic plan? And we really get it to look at it. We aren't, don't feel bad that you don't have that. Maybe you're a year out and some of this isn't relevant. So it's helped improve the conversation about what's important about an, an effective and an efficient nonprofit. Um, so this common platform to talk about what are the key, what does the board look like? Do they show up at board meetings? Does that matter? We have used it in a way that I think regular donors as well as the funders have looked at this that we're strengthening our sector in Kansas City. And the ones that aren't very good here are kind of falling off. Mm -hmm. So that can't do these things that you see some real warning signs. So it's kind of an early detection, early warning system, if you will, as you look at this. So um, we've had funders come together on sectors. We had a donor that really wanted to impact early education. Um, they wanted to do kind of a rating system with providers and they all had to have a profile first before they could be involved in this system. So it's now at least allowing us a common platform to look at even subsectors as well as broader. So we're using it both as, I think, a self, really good self-assessment tool for a nonprofit. And we actively engage the boards and the board chair. We interviewed the board chair. So they use this themselves for a roadmap for their own organization to help strengthen it. Yeah. Jeff? The bottom line for getting people to change how they do things is if it gets results. And it, what we've found in, in early childhood, uh, some funders have pooled dollars and they have committed to using data with our support and over the last four years they've seen a nine percent increase in the percentage of children ready for kindergarten that the ripple that that is sending across the community about the benefits of actually using data to drive decisions is incredible so in the end if you can stick with it long enough to get a a, a win uh, that can begin to get you towards that tipping point where I think you can bridge the gap between the desire to do something and the will to actually make it happen. Mm -hmm. and, and Jeff, if I can just add quickly, I think one important point to emphasize is it's not just about having the data. There's really a need for an infrastructure organization that actually manages the collection and ensures that people are using it and helps them figure out the meaning for it. You know, Jeff has a team of eight people. The, the Cultural Data Project has a help desk that you can call to figure out how to fill out the forms and what some of the data means. And so I think part of what's happening is not just the development of systems, but the development of a new set of organizations, of infrastructure organizations in the nonprofit sector that enable the kind of learning that this data requires and support. Yeah, no, that's great. What I, can I raise an issue, yeah, can I yeah, raise an issue about that? Because you know, we're hearing a lot about the creation of platforms and you know, all of us now have platforms. You know, that, that's what we do. Um, Actually, I think creating the platform is the easy part. And I think Mark's comment really hit it head on. The difficult part is maintaining a data-driven platform 
and getting people to use it consistently over time. And one of the big problems in the middle of all this is the business model behind these platforms. Um, a lot of them depend on donor largesse, which is a risky business plan. Um, donors change, leadership at foundations change, uh, and if you try to create some kind of revenue stream out of these platforms, it goes against a lot of the, what's been talked about at this conference of open and free data. So it's a real dilemma, I think, these kinds of efforts have to wrestle with. Yeah. I mean, how, how are all of you dealing with that, that question? Because that's come up in a couple of the prior conversations about just what makes these actually enduring versus a few funders are deeply committed to it, you get support, kind of, and they, you, they're strong as long as those funders stay engaged in it, but they don't really have an enduring model. I mean, is that, are you confronting that? Is that a, a challenge here, in kind, of any, kind of any of you? You, you have to anchor it. In, in our world, we, we initially were going to put it in a nonprofit entity that existed for the purpose of analyzing data in the community. And there was an, a very strong pushback from some business continuous improvement experts to say it has to be housed in the entity that will be sustained over the long term that doesn't depend on donor largesse. And so we're, it, it is based, despite some controversy, in the public school system. Now that took some cajoling and some convincing, but the early childhood community, the higher ed community, and the foundations have said, we will agree to that. And, and then the, the other thing that we're doing to institutionalize it is that we're getting the superintendents of the districts that are involved, it's more than one district, but we're getting the superintendents to say that in order for you all to work in our schools and with our children, we need you to use this data platform. It becomes an expectation in order to reach your audience. And if that's part of the mentality, it begins to, it begins to change the culture and the mm -hmm. use uh, of the system. But it's, it's embedding it in the anchor institution. Yeah. Other? Yeah, I mean, we worry about it a lot. And we've separated out the, the, the portfolio management tool, Pulse, and have, um, with Google, created a, a third party license to somebody who's in the business of selling uh, and supporting software and Salesforce implementations for private equity firms, venture capital firms, and now social investment firms. But we decided not to build yet another software tool that was a new company uh, for the social sector that might have a very difficult time sustaining itself or attracting commercial capital. And so Salesforce offers you all of the security, stability, and integrity that uh, we would have otherwise spent millions of dollars to build. Uh, so we think that the software tool itself, if all it does is help a dozen, a hundred, portfolio managers better manage and track their data, that that's victory for this effort. Um, the, the data aggregator, we at Acumen Fund couldn't be both participant and judge in the system. So we said, we're, we're not going to do this. And Rockefeller has created this Global Impact Investing Network, which wanted to create as one of its service lines um, hosting the data. They're a startup social sector organization with Rockefeller behind them, but that's a big risk. One of the, 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 the new entrances that USAID has supported this project, and we do believe that if the development finance institutions, which have tried to collaborate on data sharing in the past, get behind it, that the, 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 the long-term sustainability might be solved. But it's very much an open question for us right now. So let me ask one more question just of this group, and then we're going to open it to the audience for a, for a brief discussion, and then kind of swing over to a few more pieces. I didn't see yet. Yeah. OK, quick comments, and then I have one question here. Well, can, I'm sure. sorry, you can't see the name. Well, yes. Okay. Yeah. My, my name's Kat Rusket. I'm the executive director of the Center for High Impact Philanthropy at Penn. And I have an, a hypothesis based on the number of hands that went up after Mark's presentation, which is um, that for many of you, uh, talking about platforms and systems for metrics is a few steps away from where you are now. So. For those of you who are not yet at that point where you are even asking the questions that these metrics can answer, I would recommend thinking about the kinds of questions that metrics do help you answer. It's not just about impact as a, did we do a good job ex post. If you have questions like, what is it we're trying to accomplish? Has anybody ever done this before? Is our plan reasonable compared to other efforts? Given our plan, where can we do better and where are we goofing up? I mean, to me, those, it starts with the question. 
the metrics help you answer the question. And if you're not going to do anything with the answer, then don't even bother measuring. Uh, that, that's sort of a contextual piece for a lot of what we're talking about. Well, we were talking about this Carol Larson with the Packard Foundation. We were talking about what's critical for sustainability of this data collection. And so we talked about the necessary institution or infrastructure like the public school. I was just going to build on what Mark referred to in that last slide. It's in terms of our work with the major buyers and environmental groups. So this was in, in the Monday plenary, was it Monday, <laughs> where, I, where I mentioned this. Um, it did lead to this common a uh, common model about how to approach promoting sustainable fishing practices, combining fisheries and major buyers and environmental groups to reach those, those decisions. But I, it, it underscores two things. One is there had to be market kind of conditions, and they can exist in many different ways to provide the incentive for the people who are having to create the data. And it, it doesn't have to be that donors will do it. They're probably the most unreliable group, that if you provide the data, we'll, we'll provide the funding. It can be other kinds of incentives that make it worthwhile for people to collect the data. The second thing that several of you mentioned was the buy-in of the people who are collecting the data to shape what the data looks like. In this case, this group of people we brought together not only had to come up with the data, but they got to choose who was going to convene them and help do it in Mark's group one. <laughs> but anyway, so they're just the, the issue of buy-in and kind of market incentives and ripeness to really make it something that's valuable to, to the people you're asking to put the work into it. Do you want to add something here on this? Okay, well, but there's, two, there's two threads here I want to build, build off of um, be before, we, before we go to the audience. One is just the buy-in question here, and the second one is data. We, kind of are, we, we, we haven't talked about kind of what actually is the data that would be useful, and that kind of, it, all of these are built on some premise there, and it may be because it's uncontested and it's clear and we've got all the data we need, um, but I suspect that may be more complicated um, than it looks. And so I wanted to ask Valerie just on that, that second point around data, because you've been leading a really interesting effort around beneficiary-driven data to talk about impact and kind of how that, where that's come from and how that fits into this. Yep, um, great. Well, I definitely just echo completely what Carol was saying about expectations and sort of the, the incentive for people to use this data. I'm Valerie Threlf, I'm director of the West Coast Office for the Center for Effective Philanthropy. And we're a nonprofit organization that provides kind of complementary type of data um, to a lot of what people are talking about here. And so we, we collect perceptual feedback from constituencies that work with foundations. So uh, many people here have used our tools. We, we collect, for example, feedback from grantees. And we collect systematically that feedback from grantees um, of a foundation. And then we take that data and we place it into a comparative context. Context. Um, more than 200 foundations have used our tools um, to date. And one, the initiative that we've recently embarked on is kind of an extension of our existing work with funders, which was we said, you know, we're hearing from all these various constituencies of the grantees and, and community stakeholders, but we're not hearing from the people on the ground. And what can we learn? Is there an opportunity that we can learn systematically from the ultimate beneficiaries of programs about what they think is working and what's not? And so if you're either a funder of a program or managing a program, wouldn't it be helpful to hear from the beneficiary the extent to which they're actually experiencing what you wanted them to experience and what you were intending them to experience? So we developed um, the Youth Truth Project in 2008, which is a pilot project serving high school students. Um, we developed this in collaboration with the Gates Foundation. And to date, we've surveyed um, students at 86 schools around the country and 20,000 students. And so we've built a comparative data set looking at what students think is really um, allowing them to get high quality education and what are some of the drivers. And so a couple things, just also piggybacking on some of um, you know, what Marion was saying, I think um, we've tried intentional about some of the attributes of the way we've created the program. So we have comparative data. So we're able to say to a school and also to the people who manage schools and people who may fund the schools, here's how this school did or here's how this group of schools did relative to others. Um, we also really focus on closing the feedback loop with the people that we collect the data from. 
we heard consistently from both students and school leaders that they're always the input into data, but they're never getting the data back. And so we've kept them as a very clear audience for this. Um, so we make sure that the data goes back to the students, we make sure that the data goes back to the schools, and we work with them to help them interpret the data, and then we aggregate it up and use it for these other audiences, for people managing and funding. And then we also just really focus on making sure it's actionable, and that actually people are using the data to drive the change that we would want to see. So that's that's, that's sort of our recent effort, so. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of, the, one of the things that seems to be a theme through this is that the process, that there's a platform, there's data, architecture, and so forth, but the process, as Carol said, as you just said about both process and setting the, the, con, the, the context and the structure, the process for getting data back to people, which motivates them to be part of the process. I mean, there's several process pieces here. Just very, very quickly, what, what is the most important process lesson out of this, because I think we might not pay much attention to it, yet in the end, it sounds like it may be the linchpin to these actually taking off and sustaining. Just each of you, what would be, a, you know, what part of the process, either you did well or didn't, um, stands out as important to, to understand? Well, I think, I think what we did well with the Cultural Data Project was build in a lot of process around help, services, education, training, making, making the data set uh, and, and the and the tool actually useful for the people we were trying to reach out to. But that's also what drives the cost. It would be a very cheap project to do, and it would also be, as I said before, very inert if we didn't have that. So for us, the sustainability issue is how do we, how do we strike the balance between continuing to provide really robust services so that it's actually useful and used by our constituencies, and then figuring out how to pay for that without charging the organizations themselves. Uh, we also have a team of three people, two full-time, that work with the nonprofit. So we have a help desk. They're really thought of as coaches, motivators to get the data and work with nonprofits. So we've just embedded this cost into our how we do business. So we've been, we started with four or five people collecting data. We're down to two full-time. So um, we've really gotten efficient that way to be very helpful and motivate. The other piece, we got very enamored with the technology. And it is really hard to not, oh, it could do this, it could do that. And, you get so, we did anyway, very enamored with that and what it could do, and we had to kind of like stop. We're not a technology software developer at the Community Foundation, so uh, we did partner with GuideStar two years ago, and like they know how to do some things with nonprofit data and technology. So they are now the technology provider that's really freed us to really work on what we should be doing. So that transition to find a partner that's in that business and get that off of us was very freeing and allowed us to really focus on getting more data too. Yeah. Just a quick process observation then. Yeah, I think building this into the day-to-day -day workflow of the portfolio manager and focusing on how to make their job easier. The, the most important contribution that Google made to the entire effort was the user interface. They are very good at making very simple screens and that uh, thinking about what the, our colleague in Karachi was doing on a poor internet line to get the essential data in as part of the workflow, moving from Excel into a web-based tool was the most important thing uh, that I think is driving success of adoption in other places as well. I think and consistent with that, uh, this is Jeff Edmondson with the Strive Partnership. Or did you want to go ahead, Mike? Go ahead. No, go ahead. The, the, the key thing consistent with that point is that if you're going to develop the platform and, and you, know, you can get sucked in, I agree, to the technology, um, <laughs> develop it with the people who are going to be using it. Um, we, we really worked very hard at that, uh, but there's a cultural issue there, is that a lot of the organizations expect, because of the culture of the funder-grantee relationship, that the funders are just going to tell them what to do. And so even when we were offering them an opportunity to give feedback, it was muted feedback or reserved feedback, and it really means that the funders have to come. We would have the CEOs come and say, we need your help on this, and it's an open book. Tell us what you, know, tell us what you think. It's really critical to try to, to, to respect the fact that there is a cultural relationship between funders and grantees that has to be overcome. Yeah, I was, I was just gonna emphasize that, uh, and as Carol said, it's really the buy-in that is critical more than getting the right answer. I mean, over time, these systems will improve. You'll eventually get better answers. It's not about having the right answer. It's about the buy-in. And one of the things that surprised us with all the systems we looked at is uh, the grantees are free to opt in or out. 
uh, it was never required of them. And I think the sort of open participation, you only do it if you want to do it, uh, is an essential element, uh, as well as this idea of trusting the grantees. Let them come up with the measures. Don't try to tell them the answer. Yeah. Let me go ahead now and just take a minute to, to get input from the audience. And what, what I'd like to do is suggest that right at your table, there's going to be like three to five minutes, so there's going to be a very rapid fire, and then we'll pull it back out and get some of the ideas, that just right with the folks you're sitting with, what are the one or two questions that are really on your mind out of this? Because it's striking that only a handful of folks are participating in things like this, which just may be a question of opportunity by field and so forth. But it also may be that there's, there's issues with this or questions that you have about this whole process. So just if you just turn to your neighbor and share, like, what's the question that's really raised for you, and what's the biggest obstacle to you to actually saying, I'd, this is something I'd love to jump into in my field of endeavor where I'm working. And then we'll just get, hear from a few folks as they're doing that. Again, three to five minutes, right at your table very quickly, and then we'll just list, kind of capture a few of those. What I'd like to do, let's go ahead and get, let's come back together and hear from some of the groups. What I'd like to do is just go around and have uh, different folks. Uh, I know the goal at the table wasn't to come up with the single question. Uh, it was really to kind of provoke a conversation about this. But it would be great to hear, and we'll just go around and hear just very brief comments from folks about the question, the key question this raised for them, or the key barrier challenge this poses to them when they think about what it would take to actually bring this into their field or do this kind of work. So we'll just kind of go around, and we do want to use microphones. There's folks actually around the world listening to this, so um, we'll, we'll slow it down enough to make sure you get a microphone in front of you. But again, just kind of brief comments on the questions, the thought that, that um, this sparked for you. Hi, my name is Melanie, um, and full disclosure, I'm as much of an egghead as anyone at this table. I'm an evaluator, and I've worked on shared measurement systems for a long time. I also do a lot of storytelling work and visual work. And we talked a lot at our table about to what extent is there a real communications issue around communicating to a broad body of donors and really change agents the value of strategic philanthropy or metrics-based or evidence-based decision-making? And how much should we actually be trying to utilize storytelling strategies to try to influence behavior, um, but to actually think pretty critically about the stories that we're telling? So where's the balance there? Mm -hmm. No, that's great. Thank you. And we're going to keep, we're not going to respond. We're going to go around and get four or five of these perspectives. That was terrific. Yes, please. Uh, my name is John Yance. I'm uh I'm the author of a book looking at the uh, future of philanthropy. And it strikes me and, and others here that what we're talking about um, is part of a, a larger challenge. That Even if we were to develop the perfect measurement system, there's still a question as to how this would be implemented, what would be the channels of communication, uh, how, how would we uh, spur adoption of it. Um, all of that goes to the larger question of uh, fragmentation within the philanthropic community. And it strikes me that, that the real issue that we're talking about here is how do we create a sense of community within the entire philanthropic and nonprofit uh, sector. Mm -hmm. And we might look at some of the models that have um, really been quite successful on the web. Uh, in the first phase, uh, the, the hot concept was the portal. Do we have a portal for the philanthropic community? The next phase was search. Uh, do we have a search engine for the philanthropic community? And the next phase was social networking. Do we have a social network for the philanthropic community? And it seems with, you know, the the powers that be that are in this room, could we collaborate together to create a, a web community that combined portal, search, and social networking? Thank you. Steve Hilton, Conrad Hilton Foundation. 
I think it's great that we're talking about uh, metrics and measurement, and I, I think it's, uh, you know, we're all moving in the right direction to try to get a better handle on what does it mean. And I think that's one of the things that comes in my mind is I don't care how rigorous, you know, you crunch the numbers and the data. At the end of the day, somebody's going to have to look. I'm oversimplifying, oversimplifying. Somebody's going to have to say, what does it mean? You know what I mean? <laughs> what does it mean? Because I think no matter how rigorous, thoughtful, analytical, mm -hmm. there's so many nuances. And as one of my colleagues said here, is that there's so many qualitative things that it's really, really tough to put a quantitative number to. And that's where there's kind of a, a gap between number and data and, and what, what does this really mean? And how do we take that and actually use it? That's it. No, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It's right, microphone's right behind you. Hold it close. OK. Um, our group, the Alderman and I, I'm Jane Yet, focused on donor relations and could see that the metrics, if they're published in the community, might help to discourage vanity philanthropy, you know, getting my name on the big building, and sentimental philanthropy, going for something that relates to my grandfather's la la la. Um, however, that's the, the upside. However, there might be a downside of those donors then just not getting involved. Um, so we saw a strong need for, um, uh, for, for having a more wide, widely um, addressed uh, invitation to donors so that you know, th they're going to go beyond that. And one of the things, this is uh, Mr. Alderman's brilliant contribution, I think, that you might, <laughs> that, that, um, that the metrics should be seen as only really a small part of one's approach to many donors. Some are going to be very metric oriented, but most aren't. So in a presentation, for example, um, out of five points, the metrics might be number three. And people have already established then some kind of emotional attachment to the idea and to the mission and intellectual attachment to it. And then they understand that is also grounded in research. And Steve was even saying that you would show them the metrics and you would say, and here, it, here are some of our proof of la la la, and you can look at that later. Which they may never do. So you've done all this work. However, it's also crucial because uh, you know, people feel that numbers and research ground things. So it may still be essential. And then one more quick point. Some information, um, and for the aldermen's doing mental health work in their clinic, they can give you metrics on results of treatment. They cannot give you metrics on the impact in the community when that person goes home and integrates with their community. However, what you can give a potential donor you can say to them, um, we can't give you metrics on this yet. In three years, we'll be able to give you such and such information, six years, such and such information. What we can give you now that's developmentally appropriate in terms of developing metrics are narratives from people, are observations of outside observers, et cetera, whatever's appropriate. Great. Let me, let, let me go ahead and, and wrap this up. I'm going to turn it, I'm going to ask some questions of, another set of colleagues and just share, just because I think this may capture at least a few, you know, a few of the comments here. This was, I think, just good luck um, on here. Uh, but the one was there's kind of th four kind of arenas of activity as we kind of think about this process. And th these last set of comments kind of talked about different arenas. The first one is in, in terms of the establishing these kinds of things, is establishing metrics and obtaining data. I mean, several folks here talked about different kinds of data that might be important here. The issue of agreeing on shared metrics. Actually, within a community, are people 
kind of in some form of agreement to the metrics, communicating about them. I mean, how does it actually get into the world and how do people see it? And then the question about kind of does it actually change behavior and what kind of behavior does it change? Um, and we have kind of a few examples of hypotheses of, of what it might change. The earlier folks kind of talked about several ways in which kind of the data might, inf might influence funders and kind of how they do the, the work that they do. And let me just p pose a question to um, some of our, our experts that also, I should say, are building some of these kinds of shared platforms um, as well. But just where is the, the biggest barrier? I want to I stay micro just briefly, which is, where in this process of doing this are the biggest barriers for these things having the kind of impact and the kind of promise, fulfilling the promise they might, these kinds of shared measurement systems? Could be some place in this, this process where until we get the data right, we can keep building platforms, but we're just not gonna get there. Or we can have all the perfect data as other people framed it, and in fact, if it's not, people aren't engaged and don't buy into it, nothing's gonna happen. But what your, do any of you have a take on where the barrier is in building these? And then the second place we're gonna go is, is the fact that very few people raise their hands in this room and in, in kind of said they're part of this. Um, and so what will it take, so I mean, you, this is kind of a warm call, uh, kind of, you know, what will it take to actually scale this and really have this become a more um, dominant form of kind of how we do our work in the, in the sector um, as we go forward? But let's start with the first, the first one. What are the barriers to actually moving this forward? Elizabeth? Well, there's several. Um, first of all, there needs to be. And let me, uh, yeah. Elizabeth Boris from the Urban Institute. Urban Institute, sorry. Um, the barriers that we find are that the, um, the measures, the metrics, the outcomes need to be integral to the organizations themselves. They have to be useful, simple, practical, relevant. If they're not that for the organization, there's no amount of um, coercion then can make them sustainable over time. Mm -hmm. So it, it has to be bottom up in a way. Organizations have to find utility in collecting the information and help in identifying the out, you have to help them find uh, common indicators for the outcomes that they themselves have determined that are important for them. It seems to me, and we've convened uh, many associations and umbrella groups over time to find out what are the barriers for them. Uh, what would we have to do to get common uh, indicators across fields? And uh, it's the conversation, it's the building of the common language, uh, indicators from the bottom up that are meaningful to the organizations, and then cutting through all of the data that, and information that's out there to make simple, um, simple tools available to the organizations. Uh, in convening some of these groups, we found a lot of convergence about what's important to the groups and what they want to measure in terms of the outcomes that are important to them. But then it comes to, well, what are the tools? How do I collect that information? Who can help me? Once I collect that data, how do I analyze it? Uh, how do I know that these are indicators that are really meaningful, relevant, and valid? Um, so that's the kind of a platform that we're constructing um, for the uh, effective practices and uh, outcomes portfolio with social solutions and child trends in the human services area. Um, simple tools that are practical and useful. That's the first step. Uh, then we have to get to the uh, analysis of the data, benchmarking, and the more complicated uh, analysis that uh, Mark was talking about. But one, just a question, maybe, and we'll keep going, keep going based kind of on that, is that when it's described like that, it's just striking that it's so intuitively obvious that this is a good thing. Mm -hmm. And yet, it's so hard to find um, in the world. So it's just kind of the, 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 the disconnect here, such as it is. I'm just curious, like, what's the, if we can get at that, it may be that the odds of actually this actually taking off are increased. Uh, so a couple of thoughts. This is Kat from the Center for High Impact Philanthropy. Uh, one, I think, is, is, is an attitudinal barrier, which is you have to be willing to not do it right, to have it be messy, to not be able to start with the kinds of platforms and data these folks are talking about. And, and I guess one thing I would encourage people to know is that you can get a lot of great insight on your work um, with very simple tools. And especially because this is the Global Philanthropy Forum and many of you are giving outside of the US in very resource poor settings. 
Here's an example that Henry Perry pioneered in Haiti with Hospital Albert Schweitzer. We don't even really know with certainty what mortality and morbidity rates are for malaria. We don't actually. So when you're starting at a point where you don't even really know the baseline, you know, some people will say, you know, we're so far away from getting metrics. What Henry Perry realized was the same community health workers who are going to remote villages to deliver health messaging around um, breastfeeding or uh, supplying medication could also ask one or two questions of every household they visited. And with those one or two questions, they now had a baseline. And then when they went back six months later, they could have some more information about behavior shifts. And, and that's the kind of, they weren't afraid of just experimenting. And, and that, that model now has, now has become well documented as a valid way to get information. So I think some of it is not being afraid. Well, not being a friend, and it also sounds like not getting a PhD, um, and, I, and kind of, I mean, in, in the sense of the scientific method and RCT and all of that may have kind of confused a little bit of this as well uh, along the way, because that would, many people would critique something like that as not being rigorous, yet it may be exactly what's needed. Uh, Jeff, Brad, or, real, real quick, yeah. Jeff, the one mantra that we've adopted in this work going forward was from the president of the Northern Kentucky University, it's don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Yeah. And we've constantly had to say that because we'll want to put something out there or do something, and somebody will say, well, that's not exactly the right way to do it. Don't let perfect be the enemy of good. Yeah, um, yeah Br Brad Smith of the Foundation Center. Um, I think uh, it's one thing to talk about what kinds of metrics and success indicators uh, and data you would need for nonprofits themselves working in a common area to measure their success. Uh, it's probably another question to ask, what would be most effective with donors? Uh, and I think it has a lot to do, there was a question that came from the, or a statement that came from the back about, we need to be more of a field, we need to have common language. Um, I think that's a very high bar, I don't think it's gonna happen. I mean, there's about 97,000 foundations in the US of one kind or another. Um, they have sometimes very highly individualistic behavior, it's both the strength and the weakness of our field. There's a lot of strong-minded, um, high net worth people that come into this field wanting to change the world and use their energy and their intuition to do so. But that's a very hard thing to create a central planning ministry for. And there, there will probably never be one. I would hypothesize that where you will find the greatest uptake for this is among coalitions of nonprofits and coalitions of donors that have a very high drive to make an impact on an issue that they feel a sense of urgency about. Mm -hmm. This is what's happened with climate change. This is what's happened with uh, basic education in some parts of the country. But it won't necessarily happen on all issues in the same way. Um, otherwise, I think the field is too heterogeneous. There's been some, there's a very good study that some of you have probably seen um, called Project Streamline, which was an attempt to sort of try to get foundations to lessen all the individual demands they made on their nonprofits. And one of the suggestions is, you know, something simple, a common application form. Well, the experience with common application forms is that everybody loves them and adopts them at the beginning, and then they start to attach appendices to them <laughs> for our particular foundation. Uh, so it's, I think it's tough to expect this for the whole field and, and probably not even necessary. I'm Laura Ariaga hyphen Andreessen, um, <laughs> SV2 in the Stanford Center on Philanthropy and Civil Society. I want to build on what Brad said in two regards. We cannot forget in the midst of these really important uh, and very uh, industry edge discussions about metrics that philanthropy is an art and a science, and it is primarily an art. Although we want it to be driven by the mind and measurements, the reality is it is driven by emotion and sentimentality and passion. And upwards of 82% of all philanthropic dollars last year, including bequests, about three quarters from living donors, 
um, came from individual philanthropists, not uh, these institutions, these nearly 100K uh, reporting foundations, family and public foundations. And 36% of all philanthropic dollars still go towards religion. And that is a 50% low point, um, a 50-year low point, pardon me. On average, it has been about 50% over the last several decades. So what is most important um, in my mind about how we get broader adoption is by working through these coalitions, working through giving circles, working through community foundations, working through uh, venture philanthropy partnerships, working through um, our community here that Jane has created in the Global Philanthropy Forum. Each of you present here, you are the early adopters. You are the leaders in our field. And what we can, in my opinion, the greatest impact that each of us can ultimately have is by setting an example for our fellow individual philanthropists who are channeling the vast majority of dollars because simply looking at what major institutional funders such as Packard and Hewlett, while they are inspirational and are perfect examples of how to best practice philanthropy, they're simply untenable for us as individual donors or for those of us who have very limited staff or unstaffed family foundations. So it is the work that each of us can do by setting an example and then actually becoming a part of leading coalitions around not just issue areas, but rather around how we can educate and empower our fellow individual donors to um, approach philanthropy with a scientific edge to our very heart and passion driven desire to affect positive change. Right. Paul, just I'm curious, the, the balancing act between passion, data, strategy, you, kind of you need them all. I'm, I'm Paul Brest from the Hewlett Foundation, and I want to talk a little bit about the, the, the science side of, of Laura's um, group of you know, art, passion, emotion, and science, because I think they're all necessary. Indeed, I want, I want to suggest, and I want to go back to Mark's opening comment and clarify, I hope it's clarifying what I think somebody might mistakenly take away from this which is that these three stages replace each other rather than build on each other. In fact, there is a part of philanthropy, and that is testing whether, whether a theory of change work, works that does, in effect, require a PhD. Most of it doesn't, but that doesn't. Uh, and randomized controlled trials are not the only way to do it. I mean, I start with the assumption it's all, for everybody in this room, it is about social impact, it's about outcomes. And that requires having a sound theory of change, so you know whether a particular approach is achieving the outcomes. It requires high-performing organizations. And it also requires that the organizations and donors change their behavior based on knowledge about what works and what doesn't work. And without social science, again, not necessarily randomized controlled studies, indeed, as, as Jeff Edmondson suggests, sometimes the data, indeed, the best kind of data you can get from a performance management system is sort of econometric type data, data that will lend itself to econometric analysis, which will tell you whether you're achieving the outcomes. A performance management system ideally produces that as well as you know, pure performance uh, data, organizational performance data. But without that, without that knowledge, you don't know whether an after-school system works. You don't know whether health intervention works. You actually don't know what's going to affect donor behavior. That is, what's going to affect donor behavior is itself a really tricky question of social science. So randomized control studies are the gold standard. Uh, they're organizations like you know, the Poverty Action Lab at MIT, which do phenomenal randomized controlled studies on development interventions, which are of great interest to people attending this conference. But you know there are quasi, quasi-experimental designs. You can do less than randomization. You can do before, after. You can do econometric analyses based on existing data. You know, each everything has its problems. But as as Kat and a number of people say, you do your best, right? You don't you, the, the 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 perfect shouldn't be the enemy of, of what's plausible. So I just want us to you know to understand that for 
that in the end, whether something works or not is a really key question. You can have a organization that is doing phenomenal work, but if, it act if its outcomes are not actually creating, if it's not creating the social outcomes it wants, uh, it's just not worth the work. So Kathleen, uh, from um, GEO, the head of GEO, Grantmakers for Effective Organization, do you, what's your take on kind of where, where this stands in terms of perhaps finding coalitions to build off of to scale this kind of, this kind of work? Well, one of, the, one of the observations that has, has kind of come to me both in reading Mark's great work and hearing these examples is that the shift that I think is really powerful here is <coughs> metrics um, for whom and to what end. So we, we started, many in philanthropy start with a drive toward metrics for ourselves, right? Because we need to know stuff. Um, and that becomes, uh, you know, very, that qu quickly falls apart. The metrics for whom have to be for the people who are closest to the, to the decision making. It has to be for the people on the ground who are in a thousand circumstances where a bit of better data can help them make a better call. And the, the to what end is to drive performance improvement. Um, you know, I think philanthropy um, it, and, you know, the randomized controlled trial is one of those, those aspirational things where you're looking for proof. And proof, though, might be the thing that, that would be necessary in order for HHS to drive, you know, $500 million after something. For most of us, we're looking for how we can do it a little bit better, how we can make some better decisions, um, what are the, what's the, the assumptions we need to test, what's the information we need to be able to do this a bit better. Um, and what this opens up for me in terms of, of scale is, is what needs to change about, about funders. Um, as some of you might know, Geo asks that question all the time. What are the things that, that we in philanthropy can shift that will ultimately help those on the ground achieve more? Because our success depends on those folks. And um, for this common metrics to really take hold, the shift that I see that's pretty powerful is in how we think about ourselves and our role in collaborative problem solving. So I love the example of, of Carol pulling together the best and the brightest um, on the, the fisheries question to have them determine Packard's theory of change, um, you know, to help have them de determine how the field's going to approach this. You were a player in collaborative problem solving. You certainly were not telling them what Packard's theory is on this and asking them to operationalize it, um, which is a very different thing. And some of our practices are just going to have to fall away. If we're going to be, if we're going to be um, uh, effective players in collaborative problem solving, if we're going to help lift up, you know, Northern Kentucky and Cincinnati's, you know, the kids' accomplishments, we got to understand that we are just, we're, we're basically bit players in many circumstances. And we've got to adjust the way we deploy money, you know, the way we think about our, the paperwork, our applications and reports, so that they're not getting in the way of, of the progress of, of, a, of the collective good. I mean, are there places where there's, um, there are people that say, that all sounds great, but I don't want to play? Oh, like, sure. I, like collaborative, I mean, there's collaborative problem solving. I mean, I'm just curious where the, the line is and the barrier is to people saying, I love it, I, keep me posted. I, mean, I can just imagine a lot of these meetings. So we, we send out an email to all of you folks to say, you know, by subgroup, we're yeah. going to come up with collaborative theories of change. We're all going to get together, and then we're going to collectively decide kind of where we think the highest potential investment points are. And I mean, I, don't, I won't ask how many people will attend the meeting or won't, but my guess is that that's not a meeting that everybody wants to go to. They're but, kind of like, look, we're pretty clear on what we're doing. We've been doing it for 20 years. I don't, I, good luck, and I hope I learn something from it through a report you might write. And I don't want to be kind of overstated, but I'm just curious, yeah. is that, in, in the experiences of some of you that have been building these, we've talked about the wonder of all the people who join. Is there also a group that don't? Well, isn't there a first do no harm? Yeah. You know, if, yeah. if you don't want to play, fine. Um, you know, if you, if you think that this is worthwhile, just put some money in. Don't let your, you know, your um, processes or ego be a barrier to progress. And... Um, uh -huh. You know that that seems just fine. You yeah. don't have to be you don't have fully to be collaborative, right. um, but just don't get in the way. Yeah. Did you have any that didn't join? 
Uh, this is Roxy from yeah. Kansas City. One thing that is we're having the conversation, we did start with a very elaborate theory of change chart that we wanted nonprofits to fill out. Guess what? Nobody could do it. And we realized, you know, we got to step back here. We're not speaking the language as many of you have spoken. And so we really simplified it. What does success look like to you? How do you monitor? How do you know your programs are working? And give us some evidence of success and blend that storytelling and also some real numbers. And guess what? Everybody can answer those questions. So I, my advice is, you know, simplify this. I think sometimes we get too carried away in um, our own, you know, what is the, the language? I'm understanding now their theory of change, but I've asked it in a way that's very user friendly. I use the word success. We empower them on what they are doing. So they're proud of what they're doing and they can tell their story better as well. Um, Carol and then Mary. Yeah, I'd like to pick up on that because when you ask the question, Jeff, about what's the barrier, why don't more people raise their hands about these things, I think in some ways language that we use uh, is sets up a polarization that doesn't need to exist. Mm -hmm. So, you know, many of us have felt at different times that there's some uh, difference or some, some real stress between metrics and passion. Um, well, maybe there's a problem with the word metrics, right? And in, in our experience, metrics, numbers do matter, but a whole bunch of other information matters. And usually what we're talking about when we ask grantees questions or we ask ourselves questions, it's not just numbers, it's other kinds of information. Mm -hmm. Another polarization is it takes a lot of staff or it takes, you know, in a big foundation or and it's not an individual. And actually, I think that um, it doesn't necessarily take a lot of money and there are places to get information that is useful to individual donors as well as to large organizations. And in our health insurance work, in our fisheries work, in our climate works work, there are a whole bunch of individual donors who are benefiting from, it's, it doesn't take big size necessarily. Mm -hmm. Another polarization I think is about how we use it and how we use it to make decisions. It doesn't drive a formulaic decision to have information. I mean, it isn't like you get that and all of a sudden, it's like even the term evidence-based decision-making, it's, it's evidence-informed decision-making. Mm -hmm. It's, so we use these, this language and some other people here have used language of continuous learning. Well, maybe that's, or, you know, continuous improvement. I think learning is really good language, you know, and, and it hasn't been as, and I think, I think um, being, <coughs> You know, we, we say real-time learning, you know, that, that you want it to be continually refreshed. Mm -hmm. It's not a static thing where you look at it. Mm -hmm. um, and then the final thing I would say is that to say that we, I don't think there's anyone who doesn't do evidence-informed decision-making, even those who view themselves as very passionate grant makers. Mm -hmm. It's what, what is their information that they're finding useful? And could it benefit from a discussion with others in a more common a more common um, language around it. But so I, I think we set it up in ourselves that, that there's more common ground here. That no one is saying it's, it's evidence driven or it's metrics driven or it's formulaic decision making. It's how do we make better decisions? How do we learn? How mm -hmm. do we get information about what's working? Marian? Yeah, I just want to follow up on that. I mean, certainly in the arts particularly, we have, we have encounters with some donors as well as some cultural organizations who say, yeah, but how can you measure joy? How can you measure the truth of the imagination? You know, that's the most important stuff. And uh, I think the answer is Paul's answer and, and the answer over here, which is you tell stories. You, you combine data with storytelling. You use all the different... Um, uh, uh, mechanisms that you have to combine it. But I think it also is, you know, for me, every day I have to remind myself that somehow data seems to people to be more powerful than uh, than their own stories or than, or than their joy. And that we have to learn to be soulful about data or we won't be able to find a way to communicate with the people who are focused on the passion part. Yeah. Let me ask, let me follow, the power of data, Brian, when we talked a little bit before, you talked about accompanying that needs to be kind of a culture change around the issue of failure. 
what works. We haven't talked about the fact that the data, we're, we're kind of data shows what works, but also shows, also shows what doesn't work. What, say, just say a little bit more about kind of the, how that may be playing into the challenge of, of kind of implementing this. Yeah, th that was the point. Um, I, I do see uh, the point Carol makes around language. A failure is a, we've been talking about success and impact, and, and, and we do balance the qualitative with the quantitative, but at the end of the day, we actually want to find failure. And in um, you know, venture capital in Silicon Valley, failure is a badge of honor. If you haven't f succeeded until you failed in a couple of companies. In corporate world, failure is kind of a fact of life. It's not something you seek out, but it happens. Uh, in philanthropy, failure is not an option. Um, if, if I make three out of 10 good decisions in my life, I think that's a success. And I would challenge most of you in the room to think about the three out of 10 grants that have failed. And one of the biggest barriers to adoption is that people are very concerned that the transparency of the data is going to lead to failure. So creating a safe place where we say, oops, we all make mistakes, this happened, uh, is going to be important for us to um, encourage people to adopt, people who are taking big risky bets, to understand and learn from and share from those failures. But in, in forums like this, it might even be great next year to have a, a panel on you know, big mistakes in philanthropy, learning from failures. Because I know in my own life, it's failures that you learn from. And somehow we need to change the mindset around failures and use the data to understand what we could have known before it happened uh, as a way to inform the kind of decisions that we're seeking to collect the data for. And Brad, let me... Let <laughs> so, sounds like there'll be a panel next year uh, on this. I'm, the, the, the question of scaling this up, we talked a little bit about kind of going from niche places, kind of niche arenas within which this plays to actually more of a mass kind of movement, either it's a movement or a platform. Given what you said earlier, I'm curious, is the way to scale it up through kind of community by community in a disciplined way, or are there other things that might be considered um, to really extend the reach of this kind of work? I mean, I think there's, um, you know, we're talking about a huge continuum. It, it, we, we started out with sort of the, the, the Cadillac of this, shared metric platforms, the, the, best, the best examples that are out there. I think the Cultural Data Project is fantastic. I recommend it to people in all sorts of other sectors. It tends to say sort of ghettoized in the the cult, arts and culture sector. And then at the other end, we've talked about, I think you use the term spray and, spray and pray. Um, I think there's a huge range of options for all donors between those things. And I find one of the true values of a forum like this is it takes very large global issues. And I found it really fascinating when you asked the question at the beginning about why people cared about results really nobody quite articulated that I think the major reason people care about results is because of urgency. I mean, the velocity of information in the world we live in makes it absolutely impossible to ignore the urgency of the issues that we're dealing with. And here we've talked about water, we've talked about health, we've talked about climate, we've talked about food. These are the big pressing issues of our day. And I think if you're going to work as part of a coalition on climate like climate works, which represents probably some of the best of the best of coalition and strategic philanthropy. Or whether you're just starting out with your philanthropy and you attend a conference like this and you're at a water panel and you get the lay of the landscape and think, well, there's a place I can plug in. I mean, that's a huge advance. Um, I think in terms of how we find out about this, um, you know, we can build reasonable data that answers one very simple question, and that is who does what where. And if more of us as donors knew that before we wrote a check, that would be a huge advance. Um, that's the first step. I think at the high end of coalition building, um, we've got these shared metrics platforms, which really are the gold standard, I think. Valerie, last, last thought. Yeah, just a quick thought. I mean, I, I think I want to react sort of to what Laura and Paul was saying. I mean, Center for Effective Philanthropy, our, our tagline is sort of better data, better decisions, better philanthropy. And I think this, what we've tried to do is espouse an, an orientation that um, while people can be passionate about their cause, they should be intentional about how they choose to deploy their resources. And so our definition of strategy is, you know, um, we, we did some research and sort of espoused a definition of strategy that's like you're focused on the external context 
and you're collecting information and you have some logic about how what you do gets to what you want to achieve. And, and what we saw was just such a continuum when we surveyed of where people were and, and even in the foundation community and sort of as institutional. So take it even further back for individual donors, but that, you know, we, the field's just taking time to move in terms of where people are along that continuum. And, you know, only 50% of people a foundation surveyed could be defined as strategic sort of under that definition. But that's moving and that's growing and, and it's really about harnessing the data as Paul was saying to really, you know, inform what you're doing because otherwise what what's the you know, can your resources be more effectively deployed mm -hmm. elsewhere? Let me, we need to wrap up now. Um, I have learned at this conference that it is always on time, which is highly <laughs> unusual in conferences I attend. Um, and I just want to first thank the panelists and everybody um, here for the, the terrific thoughts, for the work they're doing, and in many ways the scaffolding underneath which the rest of us are all working. Um, but, but the points that were made, I think Laura's point a little while ago about each one of us can actually participate and helping make kind of these systems work, Brad's point at the end, where do you fit in? I mean, kind of situating one's work in the broader context, kind of when invited to the meeting with your colleagues that said, hey, we're really thinking about shared measurements, that you opt in versus opt out. I mean, there's a series of micro decisions because there's probably not a grand scheme here that's gonna, you know, that, uh, some, some people have been working on the grand recipe, a common set of metrics for the whole sector that we would all work on. And you know, someday that may happen, but I don't think in any of our life, lifetimes. And at the same time though, these very powerful geographically based processes, these issue-based systems built off of coalitions really have tremendous promise of not just in kind of elevating the performance of the individuals participating, but lifting the water level of the whole field by setting a different set of expectations. Um, so thank you to all of you, you panelists who will be around to, to answer further questions, and thank all of you for um, participating. <laughs>